Welcome to another episode of the Learning to Choose podcast, episode number five with the legend Lawrence Gartell. I am your host, arts advocate, community builder, creative entrepreneur, and author behind Learning to Choose, Evan Snow. This new podcast series was created with the goal to discuss the stories behind pivotal choices, learning lessons, and takeaways from interesting individuals coming from various backgrounds, walks of lives, who have lived extraordinary lives. For more information on Learning to Choose and our author and host, log on to learningtochoose.com. Our guest today is Lawrence Gartell. Gartel is a globally acknowledged pioneer of the digital art movement. He is considered the father of the paint box era, circa 1986, coincidentally the year I was born, because he actually started this technique 10 years prior to any software being written for painting and photo manipulation. He used digital synthesizers, TVs, and then output photographically as a dye sub and Polaroid prints. His work has been exhibited at the Museum of Modern Art, the Joan Whitney Payson Museum, Long Beach Museum of Art, Princeton Art Museum, PS1, Norton Museum, and in the permanent collections of the Smithsonian's Institute Museum of American History and the Bibliothèque Nationale. His biography for his pioneering efforts is included in the Who's Who, Who's Who in the East, Who's Who in America, Who's Who in American Art, and Who's Who in the World. Lawrence was born and raised in New York City and had the opportunity, as you'll find out, to teach somebody you might have heard of before how to use the Enigma computer and went to the School of Visual Arts with fellow art student, graffiti artist, and another legend, Keith Herring, where he earned his BFA degree majoring in graphics and started with his electronic career working side by side with Nam June Pike at the Media Study Buffalo in upstate New York. But before all that, Lawrence, if you could just maybe tell us a little bit of some of those early choices that you made to even get interested in art and even consider wanting to go down this crazy path of being an artist. Thank you, Evan, for having me on the show and asking me, as I knew you would, some very rather uh, personal and poignant questions. So, you know, I will start out by saying that it wasn't a choice uh, (laughs) and I didn't choose. It chose me. I used to say that I started at two years old. I crawled out of my crib while my mother was sleeping and I drew around her up on the sheets, up on the wall. And that was my first piece. That's how I typically for the last 60 years uh, talked about my career. However, um, I've since changed that story. And I will tell you that with an unformulated finger in my mother's belly, I was drawing with my own fluid in her stomach. And when I came out, I already knew who I was. And that is how I began my artistic career. I somehow, whether it be uh, a past life or what have you, Uh, I have always been an artist from day one, that I could say. I believe it. And um, from those early interactions, inspirations, influences, experiences, how did you then begin the process of developing your artistic genius, your art practice, the mediums that you decided to work with, uh, because obviously this was, you know, very early stages before a lot of the modern technology. So how did that um, creative process initially uh, come about with the choices that you made before you could have ever imagined you would have got to this stage in life? Well, I will say this to you, that my parents had the books from the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and by the way, I still have them, uh, <laughs> On they were on my 
father's living room marble, pink marble table. And they were of uh, Renoir, Monet, Manet, Van Gogh. And these books were so beautiful. And they were big books. And with, um, with prints in them. And I was just so taken and arrested by this work. Uh, and I said, you know, one day I will be these people. This is probably the most difficult, most 99.9% uh, career that one could possibly have. But I'm going to go for it. And I'm going to risk it all because I know that it's going to take a lifetime to get there and I'm willing to put in the time. So I had a very strong conviction from, let's just say, seven years old onward to become one of the greatest artists of all time. That was a goal. That was a mission that I had right from the beginning. And my mother would take me. We were very interested in art. I was interested in art. And my mother would take me to the uh, Guggenheim Museum. And I saw the work of Paul Clay, Kandinsky, uh, Miro. And my mother would say, what do you think of the stuff, Lawrence? And I was like, oh, come on, Mom. My work is so much better than that. And she would give me a slap up my head. Like, are you kidding? You know, like that. I said, no, I'm serious. Come on. You know, so like as a child, I recognized the child prodigy in these artists' works, and I believed that I could do one better. And I set my course to be able to achieve that. That was my goal, and that's what I've been working on my entire life. I never did anything else. God bless. I'm glad that it worked out, but it obviously was not a clear path, especially back in the day before um, art obviously is where it is today and there's a commercial element yeah. of art and so on and so forth. Um, could you maybe just kind of tell us yes. from where, where you grew up and then I guess to, yes. you know, college well, experience and then how that, how that, how that early exposure and those early choices to go to college where you went to college and who you met and all those things, how that kind of, then tra uh, transitioned your yes. path? Yes, that's exactly correct. I mean, you know, I gave you the beginning of the story without like, okay, well, what happened next? You know, it's, it's definitely, it's definitely like that. So I had formal uh, training. I went to art school. I was nine years old. I went on Saturdays to the Pell School of Art, which was in the Ansonia Hotel. And I actually, of course, uh, being the uh, person who has collected and has archived his entire life with my first baseball glove, my first bowling ball, and everything else in between, I have all the things that were forever important to me. And I have my first drawing that I went to art school, and it is clear in my mind uh, going the first day, I didn't have paper. They gave me a piece of paper. Uh, they gave me charcoal. They gave me a kneaded eraser and told me to sit. I rem recall exactly where I sat day one uh, in art school, and I proceeded to make this drawing. And when you see the drawing, as opposed to uh, other drawings, um, it's it's extraordinary. I'll digress about that a little later. But... Um, so I did that. I wanted to go to high school. I went to the special high school of music and art, and I needed to produce a portfolio. And so I made a portfolio from being at the Pell School of Art, and they accepted me into, into uh, what is called the Fame High School. I mean, tremendous artists came out of out – of the high school of music and art. And so that interaction was very poignant for me 
because I had met all these great people from all walks of life. And, you know, there's another kind of side channel to that to say we just had like our God, I want to say, was it our 50th anniversary or 40th? <laughs> I don't even remember, but we just had it. And I was at the previous 10 year one. So I guess maybe that was the third. I don't Let me just try to get a fix on. No, that was the 40th. We just had our 50th. So I was at the 40th anniversary uh, high school reunion. And I got to tell you something. Uh, the integration of different people from black to white to what Spanish, whatever, this was such a melting pot. You got such an incredible vibe from the the variations of people that all got along. No one was in a silo like we live today. Everyone was mixing and blending and feeling each other's vibe. And that's a really extraordinary part of the story, I have to say, growing up in New York, where people, uh, whether they went to concerts in Central Park or what have you, there was no division. We have been divided as a country. Of course, that's now going into a more political view mm. which we want to we want to <laughs> stick to art we want to stick to art but i do have to say that there was a melting vibe there and we all got each other's energies that's that's tangential to the story but i just really want to just say that so okay i'll digress and say from there i went to the school of visual arts and i was in high school and my cousin was going to visual arts and I said, you know, I, I know this really nice girl. I'm like afraid to talk to her though. He goes, why don't you meet me? I'll give you two joints. And like, that'll sort of like, you know, ease you know, the way that you can interact with her. And, you know, like I said, okay. So I went to visit my cousin Lloyd. He was in the basement in the, in the sculpture area. And there were five gorgeous girls surrounding him. And I was like, holy shit, this is college. I want to go there. So I did. I Purely based on that story, I have to tell you, it wasn't like, oh, it's a good school or whatever. They were just like, you know, a lot of pretty chicks around him. And he was doing some great work uh, in sculpture and in, in loose sight acrylic sculpture. To this day, the work is still fabulous. So anyway... I get there and I said to him, Lloyd, I don't get it. Um, uh, you know, there's no girls at this school. And he goes, oh, please. Those were the only five girls in the whole school. And like, I was like, huh? So any case, um, you know, the experience, the teachers that I had, blah, blah, blah. It was a wonderful experience, except for the fact that I had a girlfriend. Her name was Karen. And Karen went to the University of Buffalo in upstate New York. And I tried to get into that school because I said, you know, I'm going to lose my girlfriend unless I like go up there because we were dating. She was my Wonder Years girlfriend. We dated from the age of 15 to 22. We did everything together. We were like brother and sister. We even looked alike. So we, we just... <laughs> grew up in this in this thing and she went off to college and I said my god I gotta go I gotta go up there so I didn't get accepted into uh University of Buffalo but I did get accepted into Buff State and uh, they put me back a year but I didn't care because I was going to tra uh, transfer my credits from that school anyway. And I made sure that those credits were transferable. So when I went back after six months, I would, you know, be still in good standing and where I needed to be. So I figured all that out. I had a class in film appreciation. I was sitting in the back of a classroom with a giant lens watching a Charlie Chaplin movie. And some guy taps me on the shoulder by surprise. He goes, what are you doing? I said, I, I don't know. I'm just like, I, I wonder if I can take a still off of a move, mo motion picture. I wonder if that's possible. 
So he goes, well, we have a place here that does kind of like that. Why don't you come on Friday night around eight o'clock and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, you know, hook you up. We'll meet, you know, and I was like, wow, this guy probably wants to steal my camera, wants to like <laughs> take my wallet. It's probably the worst neighborhood in the world. Uh, but I was willing to go because I was all of 19 years old. So I went and there I met video guru Nam June Pike. And they let me play around on the system. I had no idea what I was doing, but I created this imagery. And then Pike said to me, what are you doing? I said, I don't know. I'm like trying to make a, an electronic image, you know? And he said, wow, you're a crazy man. Because back then they were working with reel to reel videotape and working on these big systems that you needed knobs and buttons and wires to manipulate the electronic image. And the only way to capture the image, because there was no software, there was no, nothing to grab the image, was to set up a camera on a, on a tripod and photograph the screen. Well, Evan, I will tell you that somehow, some way, I was smart enough to take the photos and go into a dark room and print them. So I have a series of works that nobody has ever seen called Day One, Hour One. <laughs> I have those pictures. And when those get shown and where those get to auction, let me tell you something. These are gonna be the most valuable images I ever made because they were the first ones. They were first. Are they good? Give us no, a context. Were... Give us a context of the year and the camera type that you okay. set up on the tripod. Okay. Uh, the year was 1975, and I had to shoot the picture. It was a Nicker Matte camera, uh, a film camera. I had Tri-X film. And I photographed the screen. I, through trial and error, I had to change the shutter speed because anything over a 30th of a second, you would see a scan line through the film. And so you had to shoot it slower than a 30th of a second. That's exactly where you had to be. So through some trial and error, uh, of getting this big line through the through the images because the refresh rate of the screen now you shoot like you know you can shoot your high def for you know 4k oh image and you know you don't see anything it's like incredible right so you can photograph that screen all day long but back in the early 70s 75 uh the screen had to be refreshed and the scan lines would appear which I have to say, you know, people would always ask me about that. And I'd say, well, listen, you know, if you have lemons, you make lemonade. If there's like scan lines through this thing, that's the texture of the screen. So depending through time, what screens I was working on, you could see lines in the imagery, but they were like, and now people would probably use that as a texture. They'd want to right. add lines as a, as a textural tool. You know, well, as a filter, then, as a filter, correct. You got it right, exactly correct. And it's so, kind of crazy because, like, w you know, nowadays <laughs> on my cell phone, I could do a screenshot, I could yes. download whatever and clip it with a free yes. editor app on my phone that might even come built in, or maybe I download it from the app store for free, yep. and in five seconds for yes. free. I could make yes. magic. And that's why I, I wanted you to share kind of the context yes. of uh, the year and the technology. Yeah. Uh, because obviously, you know, I say these kids don't know, and, and I'm one of these kids uh, that yeah. don't know about, you know, how it was back then. And then um, you prompted me to, uh, to ask you this question uh, that I remember from when we did exhibit some of these early works at the first art fort lardo that we'll probably get yes. to later could you tell us um the choice you made in producing the uh some of these images where you had to 
rub the Polaroids under a uh, body part? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, as a matter of fact, funny enough, <laughs> you know, so, so I just returned from Italy. We're going to segue into the fact that the director had a Polaroid and had me photographing uh, situations uh, with a Polaroid camera. And I did the exact same thing I did back then, which was to press the button on an SX-70 and take the film and put it underneath your armpit so that the warmth of the, uh, of the heat would uh, make the emulsion that much more stronger in the color. Otherwise, it would just come out the way it comes out. But uh, the heat sort of enhanced it. And years ago, of course, we took a hair dryer to the, to the emulsion to bring up the color. And of course, if you soften the emulsion, there were some people that were doing experimentation where they would take like a tool uh, of some sort, whether it be from an art supply store or just a knife from their kitchen, and they would manipulate the emulsion and they would make some very interesting painterly images of the Polaroids that they took. So there was a lot of uh, experimentation in the early days about shooting Polaroid film. Uh, Polaroid got wind of what I was doing and they started to uh, send me cases of film. And, but what they wanted in exchange was they wanted one of my murals. And it got to the point where I was saying, wait a minute, my murals are like way more valuable than the film that I'm receiving. So I'll tell you what, <laughs> thank you very much. And I started to buy my film because they were like, you know, I, I, literally a truck would come with cases of film. And, you know, I had unlimited SX-70s to experiment with, et cetera. And that's where I made the famous piece of mine, probably the most famous piece called Moe's Ocean, which was 324 individual Polaroid SX-70s that was exhibited at the Museum of Modern Art and at PS1. And that piece uh, became my signature where it was shown at the Nort Museum. It was shown at the Princeton Art Museum. But we're talking about 1982. Could you imagine? <laughs> no, yeah. I, I can't. I can't imagine. And I appreciate you uh, once again, kind of putting these things in context uh, because, well, A, um, you know, we were summarizing it for the for the sake of the podcast and you know, we're condensing a lot of information and processes. And obviously there was a lot of trial and error. Um, obviously there, you know, there wasn't Google, you know, there wasn't uh, YouTube videos to just look up at that time. Uh, but fortunately, somehow, you know, God bless your parents and, and you know, your your early inspirations and teachers and friends and, and collaborators and so on and so forth that were able to leave you with some insight, some inspiration and some ability to uh, bring these visions of yours to life. And then these visions, if you could transition us now from that early first experiences to now you're making a choice to pursue this, I'm assuming at this time now, professionally, commercially, obviously everybody has to eat, everybody has to live. So how did you, at that stage, now we're in 1982, um, yeah. go about, you know, trying to be a full-time artist when I understand from watching the Basquiat documentaries and a lot of the art history documentaries, you know, it was not exactly a uh, clear path, sure thing to being a, a full-time professional artist, unless, you know, you were you know, Frank Stella or one of those people. So what did those choices kind of look like now that you had the exposure, you're dabbling, you're, you know, you're having some success, you're having, you know, conversations with Polaroid. Um, how did that, uh, how did that transition to your, to your path go? Well, that's very interesting. You know, you've made some very interesting things. When you say a Frank Stella, you know, Frank Stella is what, 80 something years old. So we had like, 
you know, he's got like 20 plus years on me, I'll say. You know, those 20 years make a difference. I always thought that the whole world was 10 years older than me. They're either 10 or 20 years older than me. So <laughs> I was like a kid doing this stuff. You know, I went to the B Gallery Bonino, which was on 57th Street, because uh, my mother was friendly with uh, the artist Knox Martin, who taught at the Art Students League, and he had his own cult of people because Knox's work was abstract expressionist, but I thought he was better than de Kooning, actually, in my mind, the way he formulated shapes. And there was like buildings where you'd pass by on, uh, on the West Side Highway and you'd see Knox's work and you go, wow, that was like, you were so wowed. You know, like we have like, that's the thing. Everyone is so jaded today in every aspect of life, whether it be a nude figure or a painting or this, nothing really like just jaw drops you anymore because you've seen so much of it. We have to talk about really the difference in society, culture, you know, even the sneakers were down to like, you know, I had Pro Keds, uh, Converse, and then Puma came out with a suede sneaker for like $22. And it was, uh, a Converse was $8.50. You had three choices. You know, it's just like if you said, uh, Gartel, hang on a second, I'm going into Publix, I'm going to grab a drink. You could be there for three hours trying to figure out what freaking drink you're going to have, right? There's <laughs> all sorts of energy drinks. There's uh, flavored water. You know, it was, you know, 7-Up and Coke and, you know, what, uh, sun-kissed orange? That, that was it. Today, there's so much choice. There's so – the world is so plentiful of everything and to be very, very honest, in America, there's a lot of crap because it's mm -hmm. a matter of, of people, uh, the enormity of, of people on the planet, people here, and their lack of an understanding of what quality is. They don't know. Mm -hmm. They don't know what quality is. They just see so much abundance of everything, good, bad, and different that there's nobody really anymore to like help guide you like the curators the writers of the new york times you know i had a sunday new york times article in 1988 about my e exhibition and it was written by helen harrison helen harrison was one of the number one writers for the new york times helen years later became the curator of the Jackson Pollock Krasner Foundation on Long Island. I mean, as high as high and mighty as you could possibly get. So when she wrote my article, that was like a huge deal, especially on a Sunday to get like a full page article. That was 1988. Uh, you know, today I have to be honest, who gives a shit about the New York Times? It doesn't well, hold the the gravity that it used to have. Does not. And, and it and and times have changed. The the one context of this period of art before eighty eight and and more um, in the late seventies and early eighties. And once again, I'm only you know hearing this recollected from these Basquiat documentaries that I found you know so fascinating. And inspirational for mm -hmm. me, but the way that they summarize it around that time period was uh, in art. And obviously, Gartel and I are both, you know, well, he's an artist and I'm an arts advocate, and, and arts had a profound impact on both of our lives. But the way that they summarize it then was they were pushing minimalism to the point that it was academic and it was white lines on white canvases, on white walls, and obviously, needless to say, primarily mostly white people. And um, around that time, as I've now alluded to twice, you know, in comes a young, um, you know, Caribbean American, uh, African American yeah. gentleman by the name yeah. of John Michel yeah. Basquiat, who started painting outside yeah. the lines and things changed. But as it relates to you and for the sake of this podcast, so now you're, you know, you're in New York City, you're starting to rub el elbows with some people that I'm sure at the time you didn't know that Keith Haring was going to become Keith Haring. And there was a, uh, another 
uh, somewhat famous artists that we'll get to mentioning, but kind of how, how now that you're in the scene, you have a, you have a, a, a body of work, you have a style, you have a medium, you have something you're developing. Um, how did some of those choices, well, A, kind of just get you wow. um, showing and, and hopefully set or eventually selling um, and then eventually getting to the point where you end up teaching somebody we might have heard of before how to use the yeah. computer? Okay. Well, first of all, let's back up into what you talked about minimalism. Okay. So I'm a graduate of the School of Visual Arts in 1977 and minimalism where, where uh, somebody put like a tile in the corner of a room and called it art. Okay. Uh <laughs> This was so meanwhile, most of the kids who went to school uh, came from blue collar families and someone who was a taxi driver spent all his money sending his kid to college. And, you know, he sees a tile in the corner of the room. He goes, that's what I spent my money on. And they were trying to like uh, they wanted to lynch Silas Rhodes, the president of my school, because like after four years, this is what you're coming up with is like a tile in the middle of the, uh, you know, of the room. And listen, I have like a million, I could digress and tell you a million stories about the artists and the galleries with Leo Castelli and all the minimalism that was going on, like three round balls in the middle of a giant warehouse, you know, and you go, that's it, you know? And like, so like, it was the emperor's new clothes. It was totally the emperor's new clothes. And it was, you know, uh, someone who like, you know, when you learn about art history and the Baroque era and Renaissance and everything else and Michelangelo and you see this shit, you go, you know, I'm sorry. This is this is bullshit. This is the emperor's news clothes. They're like jerking people around. And so, you know, if you were smart enough to have your own vision and say, no, I, I disagree. This is nonsense. You know, and it does come from abstract expressionism from the 50s and the Rockefeller Foundation and the formulation of the Museum of Modern Art. And you realize that it also has to do with the idea about the Cold War and Russia and intellectualism. It's very deep, I have to say, but it's all about conning people and 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 bullshit and saying, you know, we're more elitist than you, you know, don't you get it that like, you know, one mark is going to be, uh, you know, makes all the difference in the world. So minimalism. So that's, that's the story on that. So I have to, I have to really kind of, you know, just dismiss it. I will dismiss that era. So if you, if you want to digress, and talk about so that like, well that was 70 you said 77 school seven, of visual yeah. arts that was min, yeah. that was minimalism time and then yes. obviously around this time uh is the time that thankfully right things did start to shift and there was some um movements and, and there I was some tell people you what that is yeah i want to tell you what that was so basically Please. you have to understand again the fact of like you know uh, Evan, you live in Fort Lauderdale. I live in. Where do we congregate? Where Where do we go? Hey, man. Oh, yeah. That's where all the people are. We don't have anything like that here. I mean, I, what? Am I going to run into you in Jamba Juice? I mean, seriously, there's no like real camaraderie place. But if you're in New York City, you had Max's Kansas City, CBGB's, the Mud Club, the Tunnel, uh, the Red Parrot. There were so many places where music and art had a fusion. So this is where people went. They went to Max's. Upstairs was the punk rockers. Downstairs, you had more of the classic uh, Roy Cohn, the uh, uh, attorney. And then uh, Truman Capote would be downstairs, you know. And Warhol was downstairs. And Mick Jagger was downstairs, but upstairs you had the Ramones, you had Debbie Harry, you had the Sex Pistols. There were a, a ton of uh, punk rockers, and the music and art had a fusion. And we had a place to go where you can drink, get rowdy, meet girls, and just have a great time. And 
that's what we did. And that's where you met people. And that's where you started to talk. And that's where you commiserated. And those places, that era will never happen again. They don't have it. It's not like that anymore. Where, what, what, $2 to get in or a $2 beer? I mean, how much is a beer today if you went down to South Beach? Come on. Could be, you know, could be 20 bucks. Could be 20 bucks, all right? So there isn't that hangout place that you can just chill. And that was a catalyst for a lot of the art and a lot of uh, relationships that were started. Now, I met Steve Baders. Uh, he told me to go back to the Chelsea Hotel. We did a photo shoot that was triple X with a girl that was very willing to, to be there. And, this is a, this you know, is a family sh- uh, podcast here, Cortel. Well, I didn't, I didn't describe anything. Okay, this, this so, is true. It's not that family, actually. That's okay. But I'm just saying that th- there were things that happened at the Chelsea Hotel, and I had met Sid Vicious, for instance, of the Sex Pistols, and he said, "Listen, let's do a photo shoot." I said, "All right, let's meet on Saturday." And, I woke up late, I called the hotel, and, you know, there was only a phone downstairs by the concierge desk, uh, and a uh, guy with a London accent answered, and I said, do me a favor, can you just tell Stiv I'm going to be late? And he said to me, don't bother coming, he just slashed Nancy to death in room Oof. 100, Nancy Spungen. That is a true story, and you know, it's so funny, I have to say, like the people at 9-11 who perished, I always said the moral of the story is, come late. Because if I was on time, I might have been freaking killed by, by uh, Sid Vicious myself. God forbid, we wouldn't be sitting God here right, forbid, right now. We wouldn't be here. And the people, imagine the guy who was like in bed who like said nine o'clock, oh, I want to sleep an extra hour. And he didn't go to the building in 9-11. He didn't go to the Twin Towers. He, he, he slept an extra hour. He survived. And everyone who got up, who was diligent about their job, they went to the building, they perished. It's and an everything happens for really reason. Every no, everything happens for reason. The bad and the good. And I, I do like to, uh, I do like to think about the the positive side of that. And thankfully, you are still here. I don't know if you were in yes. New York City on nine eleven. I was um, not. I was but not. um, you know, but uh, bringing it back yeah. to the uh to that time period and that era. So now you're you're rubbing elbows with the Keith Herrings of the world. Um, yeah. And could you tell us? of the choice that you and the cho- I guess the choice is that you made that put you in a place in an opportunity to be able to teach one of the most famous artists of all okay. time. So, so I computer. went to Studio 54, okay? <laughs> I had a friend, her name was Nina, okay? And Nina Nina went to a uh, summer camp with me. She was one of the most beautiful women that I had ever known. And you could not get into Studio 54 uh, if you were a Bridge and Tunnel, New Jersey person wearing some Nick Nick shirt. They would say, you know, like they wouldn't even look at you. People begged to get in. So you had to be absolutely freaking like on point and gorgeous. Okay. And Nina my friend was that and I wasn't too bad looking myself back in that back in those days and so we got in I struck up a conversation with Andy I was telling him how I've been doing digital art and he said I just so happen to have the contract they want me to do the cover of Debbie Harry and I said well (laughs) You came to the right place. This is a reason why we met because I've been doing digital art for 10 years prior to the, to the Amiga computer. And he didn't know jack shit about it. So I said, all right, I'll go to your studio. I'll bring my computer, the Amiga 1000. I showed him deluxe paint. I had another program called Photon Paint. I showed him how you could like take a video camera with lights and, and he had the setup. 
uh, for that. And we, uh, you know, we started making some images. And, that's and how just, it uh, I don't know if you said the last, I, I was alluding to him. I don't know if, if you said the last name, but this is Andy Warhol that we're that's mentioning. Correct. And could, could you, uh, what, what, uh, which studio was this at this time? It was on Broadway. His, his particular, like, you know, the, the, the factory. Okay. I, w- I wasn't sure if it was the factory, but uh, I yeah. mean, a lot of people yeah. probably, if you're into art and if you watch stuff on Netflix, you might have seen yeah. the uh, the recent Netflix special, The Diaries, and they obviously, you know, talk a lot and show a lot about the factory. But I, I just wanted to confirm and clarify that. But uh, but keep going. Yeah. No. So, like, you know, he was very quiet. He, he just watched for the most part. He feebly, like, touched the mouse, you know, and moved things around. It wasn't like he jumped in because it's impossible. You know, Correct. it's a technical field. This is a very technical and, you know... I have to say that was my biggest thing. I'm not a, you know, people said, oh, are you like a scientist? Are you like a a tech person? How do you, I said, no, I don't know shit about this. I had to really push myself to really understand uh, how all of this stuff worked. And I was, it did not come easy to me, I have to say. that's the truth of the matter. So no, I, I believe it, was... it. And there, and thankfully, I mean, there's so much that obviously for the sake of time, we're not going to get to, there is a book, uh, well, the, uh, Gar- 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 Gartel versus Warhol, uh, yes. that you could pick up, um, which yes. did make its rounds throughout Italy and throughout the world. Uh, there's a yes. bunch of books and, uh, we'll, we'll link your, your website in the show notes. But, uh, the Thanks. real reason why I got to know you, uh, and why we're, even sitting here having this conversation for with this podcast is you at some point made some series of choices that led you to Florida. And in those series of choices, they led you to teaching. And in those series of teachings, you had one of the brightest, uh, most uh, promising students of all time. Yes. Could you tell us about that transition um, and how we came to know each other. Yes, I'm going to say this to you. So uh, I w- was working with a lady at the Cincinnati Museum of Art. Her name was Christine Orca Hall. And she w- was going to allow me to have a show at her museum. And the show before it was homo erotic art by robert mapplethorpe and basically the board of directors fired her uh they said we don't want this shit here and so she said to me gartel i'm leaving but if you want to have a show here you know you're next you're up so i said to her listen i'll be honest this is not my subject matter Uh, I'm not really interested in that kind of work. However, I do believe in First Amendment rights. And this person has the has the right to make this kind of art because he's entitled to it's his it's his American right to be able to do what he wants. Um, On an aesthetic level, I thought it was absolutely the most gorgeous printing and everything else. but that's as far as it went for me. So she said, you're next. You can have the show after that. And I said to her, Christine, thank you so much. I'm going to go wherever you're going to go. And she said, okay, I'm going to, I just got a job at the Norton Museum of Art and in West Palm Beach. And that is the choice that I made. You're talking about choices? Mm-hmm. That was the choice that I made to go with her. And, you know, this probably could be a great book because I made a lot of choices um, after the fact that I told you that I didn't make any choice when I came out of my mother and I was an artist. But the rest of the way, I had to make choices. And those choices are very, (laughs) you know, they're, they're, they're critical. They're critical to the whole story. So you're absolutely right. 
And so basically I had a show at the Nort Museum. It was 1991. I had the whole museum. They never saw digital art before. I used the still video camera by Canon that was made for the Desert Storm War in 1990. I had a show with Virginia Miller Gallery down in Miami uh, showing people. And I had a printer from Canon. I was like, no one ever saw anything like this before. Like nobody, nobody saw anything like this. And it was really just, you know, eye-opening. And so from that, I came down, I moved here. People were so nice to me, I moved to Florida. And I was the president of the Electronic Design Association. I used to come down here and, and give lectures. And there are some people, like my friend Sal Zagami, that sat in the, in the audience and said, we never knew anything about this. You were so interesting. And that was in like 1990, 1991, 31 years ago. It's hard to even imagine. But so, uh, so I was the president and then the International Fine Arts College, I got a call from the Dean, Dean Levy, who said, listen, we'd like to talk to you. Um, I said, sure, I'll come down, I'll have lunch, whatever. And I came down to speak to her and she said, look, at, listen, we're looking to hire somebody to be the chairman of the department. Do you know anybody? I said, well, I don't know who's capable of doing this, to be honest. I, you know, I'm not sure. And I said, but give me a few days. I'll try to find you somebody who within our organization who could potentially become the chairman of their department. And I called her back and I said, Dean Levy, I have to be honest. I, you know, I, I scoured the list. I thought about who it is. I can't imagine, I, I don't have that person. And then she said to me, well, what about you? And I, it was like a total surprise. I said, what about me? And then she said, yeah, we're paying X amount of money. And I said, listen, all right, let me think about this. I called her back the next day. I said, Dean Levy, I'll tell you what. You gave me a figure, okay? It's too low. If you double that, I'll consider it. And I said, and I also need Mondays off. <laughs> and she agreed. And she agreed. And, and International got... Fine Arts College, which is now, which is now Miami College of Art and Design, I believe so. But I also Correct. for heard those that, that are... I think, yeah, yeah, I, I also yeah, heard I the also... news yesterday as well that we, yes, uh, yeah, uh, Art Institute of Miami unfortunately uh, shutter shutterly closed their doors, and we know the importance of um, going yeah. to art school and arts colleges for many people because it does help them. Um, of obviously learn a lot and make connections and, and yeah. collaborators and explore. And fortunately, when you became involved yes. with this school, right. somehow the universe provided you some young gentleman that just came here from Trinidad to go to art school. And, right. and how, how did that, how did that, uh, how did that relationship uh, develop? Well, so I had a class, I guess it was graphic design, and this guy swaggers in, chewing <laughs> gum, and I'm like, who's this wise guy, you know? And he had like a total chip on his freaking shoulder, wandering in. But you know what? Evan... You got to go on instinct. You have to go on the magnetic field around yourself, around another human being. You have to feel an energy. And I got an energy from this guy. And I said to him, you know what? And he just walked in, you know, while I'm talking, probably a few minutes late, you know, whatever. I said, you know what? You don't have to do a freaking thing in this class. I'm giving you an A. And I was like, what? 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 I can I could see his head turning. I could see his face 
like completely flabbergasted about it. And there was something about him, I have to say, that was a great grand there was there was an attraction there was a knowingness there was an acknowledgement and you know that doesn't happen too often in life i have to say you have a you have a room of students there are 30 people there you know why this person i just felt it just in my heart of hearts my gut of guts whatever you want to say and then there was graduation and i said to his mother I said, I'm going to look out for this kid the rest of his life. He will never be alone, ever. And from that day on, I got to tell you, I went to his first marriage. <laughs> I went to parties. I, I, I've been there every step of the way. And of course, you know, the last part of the story is that I went to the uh, baptism of his child that's the church that he got married in and I said to him by the way I'm going to do something for you and he goes you know in his, in his typical way you know he went oh yeah what's that I said I'm going to create a piece of art I'm going to have the Vatican bless it they're going to sign it and you're going to get it back and he went, all right, cool, in his typical, you know, nonchalant way. He said, all right, cool. And within two weeks, I created a piece. I got it to the Vatican. Monsignor Gervais signed it, uh, along with the head of the contemporary art program at the Vatican. And this is, all has to be blessed by the Pope. And... It all got approved, and I got it back within two weeks. And I said, I told you I'd do this for you, Andrew, and I did it. And, and you know. And, and lo and behold, <laughs> for those of you that are not – for those of you that were not sure yet, that Andrew is my – obviously my business partner, Andrew Martineau, uh, who we created, you know, Art Fort Lauderdale together and, and Zero Empty Spaces and, you know, Fort Lauderdale Art and Design Week. and um, you know, I'd like to think that those early interactions and experiences uh, obviously had an impact and your friendship, mentorship, guidance, support, um, obviously, you know, clearly played a role in his development. Um, and, and as uh, interestingly enough, while he did go to art school uh, in coming to this country in pursuit of his American dream, he'll always tell you. You know, he wanted to be an artist, but he liked nice things, so he couldn't be a full-time artist. So he got into advertising and marketing, which is another story for another day. Um, and hopefully I'll, I'll get Andrew to make a couple of minutes to do one of these podcasts one day when we're not so busy. Um, but I will say um, it's been I, I like not just a, I mean, like a joy and a treat for me um, as Andrew's business partner to reap the you know, benefits and rewards of, 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 you know, his experience in getting to know somebody about, like Lawrence Gartel, but the way that, and I wanted to, you know, mention this on the podcast, the way that I met Lawrence Gartel um, was when we did do our first art fair, Art Fort Lauderdale, the art fair in the water, which was held inside of luxury waterfront homes on the intercoastal waterway in Las Olas, you know, in Fort Lauderdale made only accessible via boat. Um, Andrew said to me, well, I'm going to get some you know, pretty expensive artwork from the vault from my college professor, who's the pioneer, the godfather of digital art. And I mean, I, I didn't know what that meant. And, you know, honestly, and then, you know, lo and behold, we're hanging, you know, pictures, which fortunately, you um, didn't did an artist talk and told us the stories of which is how I know about the rubbing under the armpit. And, uh, and that whole thing. And, you know, the works were, you know, valued at hundreds of thousands of dollars and the collection was, yeah. you know, millions of dollars. And it was really, um, it was really, I, I mean, it was, it was my first real art experience, my first real art fair experience, my first real event experience as a producer. And um, it was just really cool that also the fact that like, you know, for somebody that has had success and accomplishments and been around the world that you were still, um, you know, humble enough to, you know, 
take a, a liking to your college student and your friend's idea for this startup art fair that no one's ever done before. Um, and then obviously we got to know each other and see each other throughout the years. And you've always been very um, supportive and complimentary, which, you know, I appreciate. Uh, and I'm forever grateful that, you know, Andrew made a choice to go to that school and take that class and have you as a professor and you making a choice to teach that school and, you know, see something in him and, you know, agree to give him the A, even though he, he didn't do anything for it yet. Um, Cause uh, everything happens for a reason. And, you know, that experience, the art fair was, was in January, 2017. We're sitting here in September, 2023. And, um, you know, now, you know, we're uh, still glad to collaborate and support whenever we can you um, do have an event coming up, uh, a show locally in Fort Lauderdale in Broward County where we live. And, and obviously we're passionate arts advocates and community builders uh, of and we want to support. So for those that are uh, local to the 954, um, could you tell us, well, not just that show, but if you tell us that show and then um, any other things that you have going on that people could potentially uh, interact and engage with your with your work. I'm happy to do that. I just want to go back and say Please. that in life, in life, you know, if you're in a race uh, and you go to the track, there are nine horses, and you have to bet on one of them. You know, and you and you know you're being now his partner. And obviously now a friend because of that relationship, uh, you know, I have to, I had to put my, I had to place my bet and my bet was on you. I don't see anyone else doing what you're doing, expanding. And I see you with your book tour and I see you uh, expanding on spaces, you know, creativity uh, you know, when I was younger, I would say that I thought that it all had to be, you know, on a page. But you can be creative in so many ways and you can expand the knowledge base and aesthetic for people by doing other things. And that's what you guys are doing. You don't have to, like, paint a pretty picture, but you can provide space for people. You can have podcasts like this where you bring interesting people on that could be inspirational i mean all of that stuff is 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 great for society for community et cetera, et cetera. so uh you know i want to say evan you're doing great things and it's just really beautiful to see two guys growing and expanding i i, I have appreciate to say that, that. I, I i it means a lot for me because you know I, I, I placed my bet. My bet was correct. You know, <laughs> it was correct. And, and so that's what I'll say. Okay. So getting back to uh, the art and stuff, we have a show called Modern Masters with my dear friend, Barry Gross, who is a master painter. Uh, his work is extraordinary. It's one of a kind. He's an amazing artist, painter. Uh, and so people go, yeah, but you guys are so, you know, have so much contrast. That's exactly the point of the show is that he does his thing. I do that. Modern masters. We don't, we don't fit the same uh, hole to stick something in and call it, you have to be this way. He does his thing. I'm doing mine in my own way and the show will show those contrasts with the beauty of both of our work that's going to be at uh, sailboat bend artist lofts in the three floors uh the opening is october 13th from 7 to 10 p.m and the show will be up for three weeks but that's when the opening is and we'd love to see everyone come for that that's october 13th and so that's the local show on and, and I'll be there event, and you'll be there. Well, you're on the, you know, we have a step and repeat where everyone could take pictures and you're on the board. So you'll, your presence will be known. Uh, well, we're glad to be a media partner at through choose nine, five, four and share. We're going to put it in the newsletter. Um, that's going to go out to, uh, um, 
to our 20,000 person hyperlocal database supporting the arts in Broward County through Choose 954. So we're certainly glad to support. And actually, I do uh, plan to send that out Friday. So if you could get me that uh, flyer, uh, I'll get that out. Okay, great. So we'll do that. On a national level, I am uh, the official artist of the Syracuse International Film Festival in Syracuse, New York. They gave me seven amazing, huge billboards that are floating around the city in different places. So I'm up high in the sky, which is kind of nice to see. And that is starting on the 28th. So in two days, Evan, the uh, Syracuse International Film Festival starts and I will be there with Alec Baldwin on the 29th and 30th because they're honoring they're honoring him. Uh, From there, I am heading into New York City for the New York Toy Fair, which will be on from the 30th to October 3rd. September 30th to October 3rd, because I created the number one selling toy on Amazon called Shashibo, which stands for Shape Shifting Box. And, uh, you know, people can't get enough of it. It's, uh, dare I say, it's in Walmart, Target, Barnes and Noble, and 3,500 independent specialty stores. And but not any Shashibo, a Gartel Shashibo. Gartel Shashibos. That's exactly right. They're exclusive deals with uh, with stores. With your artwork. With my artwork. Correct. So, you know, during COVID, people needed to, they needed something to do at home, you know? And so this was the perfect opportunity. So the more you have, the more you can make. We say collect and connect. And if you have one, that's nice. But if you have two, it's even better. If you have 20, you can really start to build structures. And it's somewhat addictive, I have to say. And at the same time, challenging and exciting. And so, uh, you know, I hope that goes on for the next 40 years. What can I say? I think it will. You've definitely set up quite a legacy that you're continually adding to. Uh, which yes. is motivational and inspirational uh, for people like myself that are obviously uh, entrepreneurial minded and, um, you know, motivated to do more than just sit at a desk working a nine to five job forever, which is, yes. you know, for those that aren't familiar with my work and story and the little bits that I've kind of alluded to, essentially, I was a Johnny nine to five recruiter sitting at a desk working a day job, uh, started listening to some TED Talks, got some inspiration, made a series of choices to step outside of my comfort zone, uh, which actually started with going to Wynwood uh, very humbly in 2014 when I was not into art at all and uh, gaining a lot of um, insights and inspirations and aha moments along the way that inevitably, in addition to fortunately meeting and connecting with my future business partner, Mr. Andrew Martineau, allowed me to unlock my hidden potential to help change my life, my community, the art world, and potentially the world beyond through some of the placemaking initiatives and some of the broader programs that we're you know doing now with Zero Empty Spaces and uh, some of the other stuff that we're working on. So I recently published my first book called Learning to Choose. Hence, this is the Learning to Choose podcast. And it's not just my story. It's learning lessons that I acquired along the way that I pose back to the reader uh, in the chapters and at the end of every chapter to help other people unlock their hidden potential to change their community, their life, whatever they're interested in. Um, Because if I was truly just a regular guy that was able to do these things, I'd like to think that anybody has the ability to do those things. Um, And I'm glad to, you know, share, you know, some of those choices and some of the things that I've implemented, like mindfulness, meditation, psilocybin mushrooms and art and TED Talks and, you know, some of the resources that are out there available if you choose to to do them. So you can find out more learning to choose dot com. We're glad to continue doing a lot of the things that we've been doing for free over the course of the last couple of years to connect, engage, inspire the community, one of them, uh, Gartel, will be participating in um, the event that I credit 
as my aha moment was a monthly breakfast lecture series of mini TED talk uh, Mm -hmm. that we still host for free every second Friday morning of the month inside the Cotilla Gallery at the Alvin Sherman Library on the campus of Nova Southeastern University, where Andrew now happens to be the president of the board of the of the Circle of Friends organization for the library. So we try to support them by hosting this event there. So we bring in a local person to share their thought-provoking, inspiring story uh, for free with free coffee, breakfast, networking, guided meditation by my teacher, Coach uh, Chloe Ravel, aka the Gemini Rising, uh, because if I was able to get some inspiration from an event like this that you know served as an aha moment for me that led me down uh, a path of arts, culture, community building, I'd like to think anybody could be sitting in that in that chair at that event and maybe get some inspiration. So we do it every second Friday morning of the month. Uh, Gartel has agreed to share uh, pending no future travel conflicts uh in january which january if you're not familiar is uh the month when we do what has previously been known as fort lauderdale art and design week but we're actually rebranding it to lauderdale art week um which is the last week in january it was traditionally the week that we would do the art fair in we still have the art fair unfortunately on pause at the moment because it is a big undertaking and we do need to get um, some sponsorship and funding to be able to bring that back in the future one day, which we plan to do. But um, Lauderdale Art Week extends throughout all of Broward County, including the Sable Ben Artist Lofts and the 1310 Gallery, uh, where you'll be able to see Gartel's work. um, And we'll share more information later. And the last uh, last thing I'd like to mention Um, If you are local to Broward County and even some other places, we now host this and you want some support and ideas and community to help you achieve your goals or even develop your goals. um, We recently brought back a free goal setting accountability mini mastermind group called Action Club, uh, Action and Zen, A-X-E-N, and essentially... You come with a goal, idea, a startup, a passion project, or none of those things, and the brain trust in the room, the random neutral third-party strangers that end up becoming your friends and supporters and community members, they will help you uh, accelerate and incubate your idea and break down goals in a very easy format called smarting your goals to make them specific, measurable, action-oriented, results-driven with the time constraint and help you think about what could you do in the next two weeks between this meeting and the next bi-weekly meeting to help you take steps to get closer to your goals. And this group is one of my favorite things uh, to be a part of. It's helped thousands of people make humongous transitions and changes in their lives. Um, so myself and my friend Eden Nolasco are glad to continue doing it at a, at a place called Art in Oakland Park, which our friend Angela Rush owns. It's her art studio right near Funky Buddha. All of this, you can find out uh, more through Choose 954, uh, social media, Eventbrite, website, stuff like that. Um, I'm an open book uh, at EvanSnow13, personally on Instagram, at learning to choose uh, you know, on all the social media and all the interwebs. Uh, Gartel, if they would like to contact you, what is your best website, email, social media, and all that good stuff? Okay, so Lawrence Gartel is on uh, Facebook. Lawrence Gartel is on Instagram. And the easiest email is gartel at AOL.com as one of the first adopters of AOL back in 1985. I still have the email. So So does my mother. We're probably the same age, dare I say. Just just about. And uh, you made an interesting observation when you started um, listening to the story and with the book uh, that my parents met through EST training, which anybody from, not anybody, but a lot of people from your generation will remember Warner Earhart and early stages of of Landmark. Um, Absolutely. Gartel, there's so much more I know that we could talk about and and all of that, but for the sake of time, 
Um, I yeah. do want to appreciate you uh, taking the time thank out of your you. life yeah, today to share a link. Oh, my pleasure. It was, it, it was very fun. You, you, you guys might have heard me cracking up uh, almost <laughs> every question. Um, I, I love this thing. I love storytelling. I love bringing people together. Uh, I love community. And I love learning from people uh, like yourself. And actually, last one, Gartel, if you are in town, I do want you to um, save the date for this. Have you been to the Victory Black Box Theater at the no. L.A. Lee Mizell? Okay. So no. uh, our newest YMCA, um, which is like one of the most beautiful YMCAs anywhere. It's literally brand new. Um, wow. They have a beautiful Victory Black Box Theater uh, that they host community events. It's ran by a woman some people know, uh, Kathleen Dean. 48 hour film project, a Emmy award winning documentarian, um, local community member, arts advocate. She um, has moved forward an event that they've been doing for a few months now, and they're continuing where they bring in local people to um, host a uh, movie night, a documentary of their choice. And um, she asked if, if we wanted to, uh, do it. And there's one documentary that I mentioned previously that I understand not everybody's really just going to go out of their way to watch. And um, I was really profoundly impacted and I wanted to mention this or further elaborate. So just give me another moment here. Uh, when I first watched the first Basquiat documentary, uh, Radiant Child, not the, the first one, the, the first one that I discovered, it was, I think the second one that technically came out. Um, I watched it 11 times in 10 days. And I was fascinated by how at this, from what I gathered from it, uh, these artists in the late seventies and early eighties in Soho helped revitalize uh, Manhattan. And, you know, you think about that now, Oh, Manhattan, what do you mean? Well, as Gartel could tell you at another time, um, Manhattan back in the day and New York city and, and everywhere was not what it was today. And, the very short version of the, the very short summary of the story, it was it was the artists and it was the arts that developed the gallery scene that made Soho what it is. So in these documentaries, um, I found a lot of insight and inspiration from um, how they how they storytell the um, the impact of the arts. Now, that documentary has already been shown a bunch of times. I don't think that that one needs to be shown. I mean, it could be shown again. But the documentary that I want to show is the most recent Basquiat documentary called Boom for Real. And it's about Basquiat's teenage years. And the only other thing that I'll say, and I, I'm not going to you know, give too much away, is um, the film opens, and this will give you some nostalgia, Gartel. Uh, the film opens with Gerald Ford, president, speaking... Right. In the background, while there's a, a wrecking ball um, that's knocking down a building in New York City, and he literally is saying that the federal government is not going to bail out Manhattan. They're going to let it burn to the ground. And you think yeah. about that 40 or 50 years ago, they weren't going to bail out Manhattan. They were going to let it burn to the ground. And then they go on to show you in this you know, documentary how these artists um, – you know, started banding together and, you know, Al Diaz and Kenny Scharf and Keith Haring and Fat Five Freddy and Andy Warhol and all these people, they started coming together. And then lo and behold, now you can't afford to do art in Soho. And that's another story for another day. So we're going to show uh, Boom For Real, the, uh, the, document, the documentary about Basquiat's teenage years on Wednesday. Uh, I believe it's November the 8th. It's in the evening. Um, I believe it's a free event because uh, it is a free community thing. It's a beautiful space. It's a beautiful theater. It's a beautiful uh, community hub. And I hope in all reality, when you know, when I do free events like this, which most of our events are free, um, that it just, in closing here, brings people together, gives them some insight, gives them some inspiration, gives them some context about history to hopefully provide 
some level of inspiration to let them know what is possible. I'm very big on history. You got to know where you're, you got to know where we've come from to know where we're going. And the last part that I would just say about why these document documentaries were so inspirational for me. Well, you know, our problems in Fort Lauderdale aren't really that bad. Um, we never really had an, a thriving art scene. They used to call this place a culture wasteland. It's not my term. That's another story for another day. It's not a culture wasteland anymore. But um, I'd like to think through the power of the arts, through the power of an art fair, through the power of an art week, through the power of a little initiative called Zero Empty Spaces, starting on Las Olas, taking empty storefronts and making affordable working artist studios and putting artists on NPR and PBS and the Business Journal, that we are contributing to a new revolution in art, a new revolution in placemaking, a new revolution in community building. And now, fortunately, this little zero empty spaces concept that we started in 2019 before COVID uh, has now since expanded. We're about to open our 30th affordable working artist studio space in Jensen Beach, Florida. Uh, we're now in three states and nine counties. We've had over 500 artists come through the program. It's changed hundreds of artists' lives thousands of times over. I never would have imagined when I set out with my cell phone to cover and support artists with the little thing with the hashtag called Choose954 and then a little art fair that we did inside of mansions with boats and homes that we'd be changing artists' lives and communities in this way. So that is what's possible through the power of the arts. And I know Gartel must have a million other ideas and ways of other success stories of how art can transform lives and communities. He's already obviously shared some, um, but that is what I would hope you could get from attending a little free film event uh, like this on November the 8th at the L.A. Lee uh, Mizell Community Center and YMCA Office Strunk in Fort Lauderdale. And I'll just turn it back over to you, just in the event you had anything else to add before we let well, just, the uh, viewer well, close. Yes, I will say this to you. Uh, what you're doing, you know, you and Andrew are doing. I don't know if everyone can do it. I don't know if anyone else can do it, but you're doing it. And, you you know, you're, you're you know, justifiable in taking credit for changing uh, culture here in Fort Lauderdale. I applaud you for it. And I'll only say uh, if I'm around, I'd love to see that film and I could evaluate it because I live that life. I know exactly what happened. I know exactly the who, the what, the where, the gallerists, uh, the other artists that no one ever mentions like Ilya Bolotowski uh, and, and others and photographers that had uh, studios and so on uh, throughout uh, the Bowery and West Broadway yep. and all of that stuff. I mean, I lived it. I, I was there. I can tell you if the film is slanted, if it's not slanted, I, I've seen some of the Warhol stuff. I mean, everything has a certain uh, gloss to it. And I, you know, you can't fool me. I was there. I know it. So I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to give happy. I'm going to end with this little trip down memory yeah. lane here, Gartel. I'm going to yeah. read off. Well, the first, a couple of the, of the, the, venues you, you already mentioned like cbgb's and you know studio yes. 54 canal zone um ps1 and, but um uh there was a grand central show this famed grand central show that i guess um that was how a lot of people discovered Basquiat's work at the beginning but some of the cast members in this documentary um uh lee lee quinones carlo mccormick fab five freddy al diaz who that's another story for another day. Uh, Michael Holman, Colleen Fitzgibbon. How about this one, Gartel? Glenn O'Brien. Okay. Who, yeah. I mean, you know, the style guy from GQ magazine, um, yes. you know, and a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, there were a lot of people, uh, obviously Kenny Scharf and obviously Patricia Field and <laughs> like so many names in here. And you just think about that, just to wrap that up. That is what's possible with the power of art, that there was a yeah. place that was burning down, that the federal government was not going to bail out. And these artists got together and also now through the power of art, through the power of film, through the power of story uh, storytelling as directed and produced by Sarah Driver. Um, now we're able to recant this uh 
this story that was in the really the late 70s, um, you know, and, and hopefully inspire a new wave and a new generation of uh, maybe arts advocates, maybe our producers, maybe artists themselves. Um, so I love this stuff. I could go on forever and ever and ever as well. But uh, I'll be respectful of your time. This was one of the more enjoyable episodes that I've ever recorded of a podcast. I really appreciate your time, my friend. And uh, you you can keep doing what you're doing and have a great rest of your day. Oh, and by the way, uh, you should also check out Gartel's son. He's a pretty talented creative within himself (laughs) and doing some amazing things himself. Yes, yes. He's got his store, uh, Headache Trading Co. on uh, Atlantic Avenue. And he's got a sneaker store and some very, very hip clothing. And my daughter, actually, is the world's greatest creative hair colorist and opened her own salon called Hair House, which is also in Delray. And, you know, the two of them are just doing what they love. And that's what I taught them to do. And that's what they're doing. So I'm very happy. It's a beautiful thing. You go support them. Go support Cartel. Join me on uh, October the 13th at the 1310 Gallery at the Sable Ben Artist Loft. Barry Gross also uh, was in that first Art Fort Lauderdale um, exhibit uh, that we did with with Gartel during the art fair and arguably one of the most talented painters uh, yes. living. And you should definitely yes. get a chance to meet him while he is still here on this planet because his work yes. will be in a museum one day for sure. Absolutely. Awesome, Gartel. I appreciate your time, my friend. God bless. Bless you. Bye-bye.